So let's do that one. Okay. This is a famous one, especially if you're in Ireland. And it's, um, you know, really what I am at this point, well, beyond going out and catching my own dinner, I, I'm a fishmonger. I have to accept that that's what I am. I'm a fisherman too, but I'm mostly a fishmonger. Um, this book, however, is about how to catch your own fish. But there's a, lot of, there's a lot of songs about fishermen, but there's only like two or three about fishmongers, so here's one. In Dublin, fair city, where the girls are so pretty, I first set my eyes on sweet Molly Malone. As she pushed her wheelbarrow through streets broad and narrow, crying cockles and ruffles, alive, alive, oh, and alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, cockles and muscles, alive, alive, oh. She was a fishmonger, and no one could blame her, for so was her mother and father before. As they pushed their wheelbarrow through streets broad and narrow, crying cockles, muscles, alive, alive, oh, and alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, cockles, muscles, alive, alive, oh. Now it gets sad. She came down with the favor, and no one could save her. And that was the end of sweet Molly Malone. Now her ghost drives her barrow through streets broad and narrow. Muscles alive, alive, oh, and alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, crying cockles and muscles alive, alive, oh, and alive, alive, oh, alive, alive, oh, crying cockles, muscles alive. I mean, as long as I can still hit that note, I feel like I should do it. <laughs> alive. The real reason is that, I, that we do that is just, it loosens me up. And then it, it's kind of nice to start with clapping. I, whether I end with clapping or not is a whole other issue. Well, um, here's my book. And I'm, I'm supposed to talk about my book today. Um, and I run a business called Sea Forager. For those, many of you may know this already, but I'm just going to backtrack a little bit. And Sea Forager is... Um, the culmination of sort of my crazy misspent life walking the intertidal zone of this area. The intertidal zone is a fancy term for that area between high tide and low tide. That's kind of my, my zone. Um, there's a famous book about the intertidal zone of California called um, Between Pacific Tides. Raise your hand if you've heard of this book. Oh, great. That's excellent because it just makes me feel smarter than you. <laughs> In any case, or more, or more nerdy, really. Um, the, the Between Pacific Tides was written by um, a biologist by the name of Doc, or Ed Ricketts. Ed Ricketts was the central character in Steinbeck's Cannery Row, and was also uh, Steinbeck's best friend, John Steinbeck's best friend. And they, they wrote a little book called The Log Book of the Sea of Cortez, which is a, a wonderful sort of travelogue of their experiences in the intertidal zone, that area between high tide and low tide, along the California coast, all the way down to Baja. And um, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a cool place. I, I didn't actually mean to do this, but why not? Um, that book, uh, Between Pacific Tides, which sort of made the California intertidal zone, put it on the map, so to speak, is um, a sort of a tome of marine biology. So if you go. Uh, to Humboldt State or wherever you can get a degree, a, a good degree in marine biology, you'll, you'll know all about Between Pacific Tides. And if you get a, um, a first edition copy of that book, 
You'll notice that it looks, the sort of the, the aesthetic of the cover is not dissimilar to this. And that's not an accident. Um, my book is a foraging and fishing guide. It is not a textbook of marine biology. This is filled with humorous haikus and poems and um, funny anecdotes um, about you know, some of the strange things that I've eaten and hunted on the shoreline. In other words, it's not a, a, a piece of science. And yet, there's some good scientific data in here, if you are interested in that. Um, but I was so influenced by that book, Between Pacific Tides, and by its writer, Doc, uh, uh, Doc Ricketts, who's one of the great eccentrics of the California shores. Um, it, it tragically died at the age of, I think, 38 or something, so very young. He was hit by a train. Um, and when, when he, it took him three days to die after getting run over by a train. And uh, John Steinbeck um, said rather famously, um, Steinbeck was, they were like best friends, inseparable. And Steinbeck, who was just heartbroken by this, um, he said, well, the only, the only thing that could have killed Ed <coughs> was a train. And, uh, and it, did. it took three days at that. Uh, in any case, um, when I got my buddy Leighton to do all the artwork, and if you just look through this, if you kind of just beep, 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 um, I think you'll see that the detail and sort of the humor come through. So like if you look at the ghost shrimp page on page 85, you'll see that the thing that he always puts in the background of an image so that you can see the size is some form of detritus from our American civilization. So like in the, if you look in the bait section, you'll see under the fat innkeeper worm <clears throat> on 81, a rather adult um, illustration. <laughs> yeah, because the fat innkeeper worm is also called the penis fish by various cultures. And um, well, you can see that there's a spent a condom wrapper there to sort of um, illustrate the size. And then if you look at page 168, I just thumbed through there. We were th singing about cockles and mussels, and we got all kinds of cockles and mussels in this book, if you're interested in those things. We have cockles in California. There's cockles that everybody calls cockles, and then there's real cockles. we talk about that later. But if you look on page 168, you'll see the, the size. The thing that he put for scale here is, the, is a cigarette butt. So uh, I wanted it to sort of have this feeling of being part of the modern world. And that's how Leighton chose to do that. But Leighton, the illustrator of this book, is just somebody I've known a long time. And I've just always loved his little drawings. And I wanted to collaborate with him. And so um, the publisher, when they saw a few of his drawings, they immediately hired him on and paid him to do all of the illustration. But he didn't just want to do illustrations. He wanted to have a hand in the design of the book. And so he called me one day after he'd been hired on to the project. And we were both very happy. And he said, Kirk, I don't just want to do the illustrations. I want to have some say in the font and the color and the, the cover and the back cover. I, want, I don't want them just to take it and do their thing. I want to have some input. I said, well, you've got to talk to the designer. I'm not sure if she's open to that. As it turns out, she was open to that. And Ashley did a great job. But in any case, the. Um, the, the point being that while I was talking to Leighton, and he was telling me that he had a, a larger goal, he said, so just speaking aesthetically, what do you want this book to look like? And I said, well, there's a, there's a book, the, the first edition of this very famous marine biology tome that you know, all fish geeks know all about this book, or all invertebrate geeks know all about this book. And I just assumed Leighton would not know this book because he's, uh, he's not an outdoorsman kind of guy. He's more of a, just a brilliantly talented artist. But I don't think of him as a person who forages in the intertidal zone. So I didn't think he would know about Between Pacific Tides. And I said, well, the name of the book is Between Pacific Tides. And if you get a first edition copy, I'll pay for it. I just want you to look at it so you get a, a sense of the feel and the look of that book. And he goes, that's strange, because I'm, I'm holding a first edition copy of Between Pacific Tides. I've had it for like my entire life. It's like 35 years old, or however old Leighton is. It was just sitting right here on my desk. And that, that's actually why I was calling you. I wanted to know if you wanted the book to kind of look like that. And uh, you know, it was one of those moments of synchronicity, but it gets weirder. 
And I said, so Leighton, you're not a forager, you're not a fisherman, you're not a marine biologist. Why do you have that book? And why do you have a first edition copy of it? And he said, well, I've been meaning to tell you this, but did you know that my grandfather, Richie Lovejoy, did all of the illustrations for Between Pacific Tides? <laughs> I said, no, I had no idea, which is just really bizarre. And um, you know, when, when things come together like that, and uh, it was sort of at that moment that, like I, 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 always, I knew from the start that Leighton was the guy for the job, but then that just kind of cemented the deal. And so um, I gave Leighton, in the back of the book, uh, there's a little, I love his, he always remains incognito. He did a little sketch in the back of the book, and he didn't want our full visages. If you go back to page 257, um, he put a catfish in front of his face. Of course, that catfish in Vietnam or somewhere in Southeast Asia, that catfish is referred to as a lele, and that happens to be Leighton's nickname. But on the last uh, couple pages, page 258, 59, I let Leighton tell the story of his grandfather, Richie Lovejoy, who was best friends with Ed Ricketts and uh, John Steinbeck. So you kind of, I want you to know that I'm more proud of the editing that I did on, on these, because this was six pages. Leighton is a little verbose. I cut them down to a page and a half. I'm very proud of that. And you would be happy about that too, because he kind of went off on some tangents. He doesn't know this, so hopefully he won't see this video. <laughs> Hi, Leigh. Anyway, so, um, blah, 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 blah. so here's my book. And this book uh, is basically a coming together of the walking tours that I do around San Francisco where I take people out. I took a bunch of Google people out once, right across the street <laughs> on the Embarcadero. Is that there? That's there, right? And. Um, Right, like when you go and you sit at the counter where I just ate lunch and you look down, that's where I did my walking tour for you guys. And then um, along that same shoreline, I do, a, um, I do herring tours in the winter because that whole shoreline just becomes infested with uh, Pacific herring uh, when they spawn. They spawn right there and with a, armed with a casting net. You throw the casting net, get your supply of herring for the year. Most people, that would be like three pounds. That's not much. But in, in one throw, when you're fishing for herring, you can, you can, you know, you get 25 pounds if you, if they're really spawning. And it's just amazing that you can do that right here. Um, as I discussed in the book, when you're eating small schooling fish that aren't eating in the area where they, where they're, where you catch them, um, the health risks are minimal. Herring don't live long enough to bioaccumulate toxins. So I, I'm just sort of thinking ahead here, and I'm talking about catching herring and getting your supply for the year. And I know you guys are thinking from there. Yeah. Um, but again, uh, this is a small schooling fish that lives up to maybe five years, doesn't have time to bioaccumulate toxins. It's super high in omega-3s and all the good things that a fish has. And you have a, just like in the winter, it's just insane, the amounts of herring. I mean, literally, you take a little net, you throw it in the water, you pull it up, and there's 25 pounds of flapping fish. I used to have a video in my cell phone I showed you guys at one of my talks here. I held up the cell phone. Everybody was just like, because it's right by the, the arrow, the bow and arrow, like right on the other side of that, where the, right where the water is, just throw a net in the water in the winter on certain days. <clears throat> anyway, I don't know why I'm going there, but I do these tours. And this was the culmination of all the stuff I talk about on my tours, plus uh, little anecdotes and, and things. Um, one of my favorite chapters to read from in here is my bait chapter. And there's a reason for that. I tend to notice that most books that, that talk, that, but most books about fishing, that mention fishing in any way. There's a lot more than fishing in here. There's seaweeds and clams and mussels and everything. But there's a lot of fish talk in here. And most books that talk about fishing, I just find them terribly boring. Because um, it's usually about how do you catch the biggest fish? And, it, and this goes for most fishing websites and most fishing blogs and fishing videos on YouTube. It's, OK, this guy's going to show us the big fish, which is compensation usually for something else. <laughs> or I should say a lack of something else, in my opinion. In any case, I wanted to give a whole chapter to the little fish that people use for bait in our area. And um, one of those fish is a remarkable toadfish. It's a named, I guess they're called toadfish because they have 
Well, they look kind of like a toad. They have these little bumps on their eyes, and they get an ugly face like a toad. Um, but they have a, this other salient characteristic that, <coughs> that toads and frogs have, which is that they sing. And this singing fish is called the plain fin midshipman. And it, it, it strikes me as bizarre, even now, having talked about this fish ad infinitum. All of these little mud-dwelling little fish. This, now, this guy's about the size of this book, a big one. And there's a whole bunch of them that live in the same area that look kind of similar and live in the mud. And you, if you turn a rock over at low tide in San Francisco Bay in the summer, you'll find these little fish. And they're all little, ugly, but kind of cute, mud-dwelling, monster-looking fish with totally weird names. So you, the one that I'm going to talk about is called the plain fin midshipman. But the, the fish that you often find right next to it is called a long-jawed mudsucker, which I just find that is such a great name. It's just like something that you would yell at someone you don't like. But it's a beautiful little fish. It's, it's the dom it used to be the dominant mudsucker. Oh, it's such a dubious distinction. <laughs> it was at one time the, do the dominant mudsucker of our region. But it's been uh, replaced by an uh, invasive uh, goby from uh, Tokyo Bay called the yellowfin goby, which in Japan is called the haze or the haze. I, can't, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's spelled H-A-Z-E. And they have little charter boats that go out into Tokyo Bay and catch this fish as a targeted fish that people eat. No one that I know of in San Francisco Bay has ever eaten one of these. But we have them here now because they travel in ballast water. And then when the big tankers come in, they dump <laughs> the ballast water. And now we have this other species called the yellowfin goby, which has displaced our lovely long jaw mudsucker because it's more adaptable. So there's the long jaw mudsucker, the plain fin midshipman. Then there's a thing called the Pacific staghorn sculpin, which is named for the opercular spine that comes out of its gill, has little notches on the side of it that some biologist with a microscope decided looked like the antlers of a stag. So they call it the Pacific staghorn sculpin. And these are all fish that at low tide, if you went down here and turned over rocks, you would find. And then the last one, of course, has the best name of all, and that is the sarcastic fringe head. And the sarcastic fringe head, I, I, I really, you guys are all, I know, eminently capable of doing this. Go to YouTube and do a search for mating ritual or mating fight of the sarcastic fringe head. You will not be disappointed. Um, the, the, the head of this fish, its mouth, is um, proportionately, I think, larger than the, the proportionate body size to mouth ratio of any species. So when it fights, it unfurls the mouth. So you have this little fish, you've got a body this long, and a head that's like that. It's insane. It's just an, a, designed by evolution to just freak people out and make them laugh. Um, in any case, back to the point, my little fish that I want to talk about is called the plain fin midshipman, and he's got all these great talents. I'm going to go through them real quickly, and then I'm going to read the story. It's a page and a half. Um, among the many talents is that singing that I talked about. Um, but it also has this fish, the plain fin. He has um, uh, spots all over the sides and belly, and when it's been eating a certain type of phytoplankton, um, the spots light up bright blue like your shirt, except iridescent. And they blink like a Christmas tree. So it's a humming fish that lights up with blue spots. It also has poison in its mucus around its, um, its spines, so that if you get jabbed with it, your thumbs, your, fin your, thumb, your fingers kind of blow up like sausages. Um, and beyond that, it also has the uh, unique ability to survive at an incredibly wide-ranging uh, depth, series of depths. So it lives offshore in 3,000 feet of water. And then when it's time for spawning, it comes all the way into San Francisco Bay. And it goes down to Candlestick Park in the toxic mud flats. And it digs under a rock in three inches of water. And the female lays her little golden eggs on the top of the, on the, on the ceiling, if you will, of the rock that she goes in. And she lays the eggs. And then the male comes in in a successive wave. And the male comes in, he goes into that burrow. And she's like sitting there. And the first male comes in. She's like, get away. Bam, bam, bam. And she knocks him away. And he leaves. And then the male that she's looking for, he comes in the hole. And she goes, oh, OK, come in. 
And then she, he goes, they're my, they're my eggs. She doesn't really speak like this. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, doing, I'm anthropomorphizing the fish. And so she, uh, she lets the ma this male in. And the male, you know, he's, he's like, OK, this is it. This is where I'm going to be for a while. And then she takes off. And she goes and gets nice and big and fat so that maybe at some point she can make more eggs. And she goes out every day, and she, and she forages and eats. Meanwhile, the male that she's agreed upon, well, he gets to spritz those eggs with his seed. And then his job for the rest of the summer is to sit there. And every single time a little piece of mud lands on one of those eggs, he picks it off. And he keeps them perfectly clean. And, and if a male comes in to try to get to spritz those eggs, he chases the male away. Unless it's the type 2 male. The type 2 male is the beta male of the uh, <coughs> plainfin midshipman population. And the type 2 male impersonates a female and then goes into the same hole. And when the, the, uh, when the, the, the guard, the, the male who's guarding those eggs, he sees the female come in, he thinks, well maybe, well, maybe she'll plant some more eggs and I'll get to do the thing. So I won't chase her away. And he's like, OK, you can stay over there. And then, he kind of watches her. And then when he's not looking, that, uh, basically that female impersonator, who has gigantic testes compared to the other one. I don't know why. But that, that, the, the invader, the type 2 male, suddenly goes over and he spritz the eggs. So any eggs that weren't uh, fertilized by the first one get fertilized by that one. And so that's how the beta male keeps his genes in the population. <laughs> I know too much about this species. <laughs> to, to, to speak about it for less than you know, 20 minutes. In any case, I have now told you everything you need to know about this fish. The way we catch them as fishermen, and the reason we use them, we use them for bait because you take a hook, a big hook, and you stick it through his nose, and you throw the midshipman out there. And they're so tough, they don't die. So you can fish with one for hours and hours and hours. And even when they die, they release some kind of ooze that fish really like to eat. Excuse me. So, what fishermen look for in a live bait is something that wriggles and stays alive on the hook for a long time. And this has always struck me as uniquely tragic to value an animal for how wonderfully it suffers. And so I just thought that um, no one else is going to write this chapter singing the praises of this little fish, so I'm going to do it. And um, I call this uh, little piece that's in the back of my book. and it's. I think representative of sort of my feeling about the book. Um, there's a lot of little pieces that are kind of like this. I try to take a different look at things. This little thing is called The Death Song of the Toad Fishes. I'm not sure why, but leopard sharks, leopard sharks are a very common mud dwelling, bottom dwelling, sand shark type of thing that lives out in the bay. They're not like a piscivorous shark with big teeth. They're a, a sluggish bottom dweller. Again, I'm not sure why, but leopard sharks really like midshipmen. And for a halibut or anything else to take your offering of one, it's going to have to get in line behind every leopard shark inhabiting the spot where you're fishing. My last time out on my kayak, I caught about a half a dozen sharks on a single plane fin. He couldn't seem to stay in the water for five minutes before a leopard shark would slam him and start dragging me into the shipping lanes. And they seemed to like him better dead and chewed than alive and squirming. As anyone who kayak fishes can confirm, however, oh, as anyone who kayak fishes can confirm, however fun leopard sharks are to fight, they are a royal pain in the arse to unhook, especially the big ones on a windy day with a strong outgoing tide on a 10-foot sit-on-top kayak. But the strange thing was, everywhere I went that day, it was the same. Along rocky shoreline, under the piers, out in the open water, leopard shark after leopard shark after leopard shark. It was as if they were following me. They were. After fishing for two hours with that one midshipman, I pulled in my live bait bucket, which usually trails behind me on a rope as I drift and decided to swap out my wildly popular shredded bait fish for a new live one. I placed the bucket on the kayak, cleaned the grim remnants of the first midshipman off of my hook, and suddenly noticed that the boat was buzzing. The midshipmen, their nests destroyed, their eggs uprooted, 
their lives about to be forfeit to the uncaring jaws of a sluggish bottom dweller, were singing. I held the bucket to my ear. What was this song? How often had they sung it? In the depths of the sea, in the polluted sluices of Stege Marsh, in the yuppie flats of Tiburon? Was it their national anthem, their rembetica, their blues? After a few moments, I realized what I was listening to. It was the death song of the toadfishes. I sat there for a while, staring out at the container ships, listening to this melancholy, monotonal death song, feeling, I suppose, not unlike the Grinch staring down on Whoville before his Yuletide transformation. After a few gut-wrenching moments, my callous fisherman's heart swollen to thrice its usual size, I paddled to shore and dumped the remaining midshipmen back into the turbid waters from whence they came. I have little doubt that a sizable school of leopard sharks had been following my kayak all day. It was not a bait bucket, but a leopard shark dinner bell that I'd been dragging behind me. I guess every fisherman has his weakness, his figurative kryptonite. But how can one justify destroying their nests and skewering their remarkable little bodies just to waste them on leopard sharks? If you find that they're a great halibut bait or, or good for lings or stripers or sea bass, maybe. But leopard sharks? Thanks. I'll stick to squid. Honestly, I think the problem here is that I know too much about these little buggers to use them for bait. And now, with any luck, so do you. And then I wrote a haiku. Because as you can tell, I'm kind of into this fish. <laughs> and there's a footnote here. I should read the footnote. You know, there's a great, um, a great masterpiece of fiction called The Third Policeman. I don't expect anyone other than me and like 16 other people has read this book. It's called The Third Policeman. It's by an Irish writer by the name of Flan O'Brien, who wrote under the pseudonym Miles Nagopaline, if you want to look up his other work. But this Irish writer, Flan O'Brien, wrote a brilliant thing called The Third Policeman, Absolutely insane book. And one of the characters in the book talks through footnotes. And it's so insane that you'll have these moments where there's a sentence and then nine pages of footnote as this character sort of expresses himself. And it's a, I, I found it to be such a brilliant and humorous little thing in a book to have these crazy footnotes. So I put a lot of crazy footnotes in my book because I'm sort of a disciple. Uh, well, I'm a, a, a worshiper of that writer. And so uh, for people who are like, what's with all the, the footnotes? Kurt? I'm like, well, I just, I like footnotes. I find them funny. In any case, um, my haiku is, and please count the syllables. Last time I did this, somebody counted the syllables while I was doing it. Haiku number 214. That doesn't mean there's 214 haikus in this book. OK, God forbid. That's just the number that this was for me personally. Haiku number 214. Plain fin midshipmen, most talented of fishes. Why not leave them be? And then I wrote here under where um, I had the sentence where I said, thanks, I'll stick to squid in, uh, in reference to not using midshipmen for bait. I just thought this was um, relevant. Uh, Oh, what did I say? Stripers, leopard sharks. Thanks, I'll stick to squid. <clears throat> I'm sure someone out there is going to point out the remarkable life story of the squid. But alas, every species on our fair planet is remarkable. One has to pick and choose, I suppose. For me, the midshipman gets a pass. For you, it might be octopus or anchovies or, I don't know, fat innkeeper worms. That's the penis fish I referred to earlier. In any case, the important thing is to remember that they're all remarkable, even the ones we use for bait. And uh, you'll notice, for those of you who actually have the book, on page 66, and, and this will be the last thing I say about this lovely fish. On page uh, 66, my buddy Leighton, years ago, I wanted to do a Toxic Avenger style comic book. And it was my idea to write it and have Leighton do all the illustrations. And so we planned it out. And you know how like with Spider-Man and I think the Fantastic Four and most of these like early 60s uh, superheroes, 
early 70s, early 60s, because like Thor, I think, well, maybe not so much with Thor, but yeah, I'm really, I'm really geeking myself right now with this. But um, have you noticed that all of those guys got their superpowers because of gamma rays? Like, like Spider-Man got it because like a gamma ray infected spider bit him, transferred the power, right? I thought, well, the plane fin midshipman, if there was like nuclear residue in the mud, it might have become some kind of crazy, you know, superhero, Toxic Avenger style superhero. So, you know, so, so this, the idea was that he would flash people with his photopores and then buzz them to death with his singing because they, they sing kind of like, it's like, it's like the Mongolian Tuvan throat singing. I was supposed to do that earlier. I didn't do that, but. Um, and so there it is. And you can see that picture there on page 66, a good, a good, uh, a good number <laughs> for the midshipman. Anyway, um, I could go on and on and on, but uh, are there any questions? You don't have to have questions. You can ask me anything, really. Uh, but that's OK if you don't want to. I'll just keep going. And please, if it's getting to the end of your lunch break or whatever, don't feel shy. If you have to go, you have to go. Yes? The song you sang earlier, why does it have to be a sad song? Why does it what? Why does it have to be a sad song? Die? Well, because she died. But she, yes, she died, but then she came back as a ghost. So it's not that bad, I guess. There's some resurrection involved, I guess. I don't think, I don't think there's a lost verse to that song. Do you know of a lost verse where she comes back to life and everybody's happy? Well, you know, Molly Malone was considered to be. So anyone been to Dublin here? Anyone seen the statue? There's a Molly Malone statue in Dublin. And unfortunately, it's a really nice statue, and she's very well proportioned. But you know, people take, they, it's like they rubber boobies. So she's got these two bright you know, brass boobs, because everybody rubs them. Uh, at least that's how it was when I was there. Um, but, uh, um, oh, Molly Malone was supposedly not just a fishmonger. She was a streetwalker. I thought that was a fictitious character. No, I think uh, it's, it is probably a fictitious character, but the legend goes that she also uh, had ulterior well, not ulterior, but rather um, alternative sources of income, as many um, young lasses had to do in those bleak times. And I think that the idea was that that's what killed her, some disease. Now, I don't know where. You'll have to Google this. <laughs> it's so refreshing that none of you are doing that to me while I speak, because there's always that fear, right? Uh, especially for somebody like me who lives in tall tales. In any case, what about, what about it? Can we catch it around here? OK. OK, now who was listening earlier? Can we catch herring around here? Raise your hand if you say yes. And raise your hand if you say no. Because there are no no's. They're just some, they're just some neutrals. OK, what time of year, I mentioned it several times, will you be able to look for herring in the water right across the street? Right. So um, for those of you who, raise your hand if you weren't even aware that there's herring in the bay. Right. That's, that's, and that's actually, most people are that way. Uh, it's, it's very strange to someone like me who spent so much time around the water and in the water. But um, the general populace of San Francisco is unaware of this. And it's not your fault. It's that herring, there is really very little demand for small fish in uh, mainstream American seafood consumption. So you go to a market, you, you're very rarely going to see herring unless you go at the beginning of herring season to Chinatown. In some of the live markets there, you'll see herring on the shelves. Um, and that's about it as far as getting them. So you have to, you have to catch them if you want to eat them. And, um, and it's so much fun. In fact, I've brought a lot of people out to do this. And they go and they get the license and they come out. And most of them are people who have never fished before. And they get into the process of catching the herring. And then before they know it, they've got you know, 65 pounds of herring. Now, it takes maybe five hours to clean 25 pounds. So 65 pounds, you're looking at like 12. Sorry, my math is off. But 
You're looking at a, a full day of scaling fish and gutting them and cutting their heads off. So I always tell people, if you do get into this, just be advised. It's a lot of fun, and you're going to want to keep going. And there's no limit. There's no sport limit on them. You can catch as many as you want. So uh, just be advised. You've got a lot of work ahead of you if you, <laughs> if you take more than five pounds. So, um, but it's so much fun. I wish I had my little video. I would show you right there, me standing right there. You know that little pier that goes out, and it's got the silver swivel seats right next to the, the metal pier? That it's right in that corner right there between that and the, uh, and the bus, the old bus station there. Anyway, um, the herring. Uh, the herring is, um, what, what can I say really? It's, it's a miracle that it's even here. When we consider that two thirds of the original shoreline, well, two thirds, more, it's more, two thirds of the original shoreline of the entire San Francisco Bay has been filled in. And this is a fish that spawns on the shoreline. Uh, most of the eelgrass beds where they, where they spawn traditionally are gone. They're just, they're totally gone. So what did this little guy do? This little fish, this little, I say guy, I keep maleizing the fish, but that's not really true. The males and the females, what did they do in order to survive? Instead of going and, and see, seeing the, the loss of their eelgrass beds and then dying out, they just decided to lay their eggs in other places. And that's an incredible ability to adapt. So in the old days where they used to spawn only on eelgrass, now they spawn under the, underneath boats and along rocks and on seaweed and anywhere. I think that in their, in their little herring brains, the thing they would love more than anything is an entire shoreline filled with eelgrass, but they don't have that anymore. And they adapt it. And so like last year, the, the spawning biomass of, of little Pacific herring inside San Francisco Bay was estimated somewhere around 15,000 tons. 15, yeah. So that's a lot of fish. And that's the lowest it's been in many years. It's gone as, in the last 10 years, it's gone as high as 70, 60 to 70,000 tons inside San Francisco Bay. That's how many are in there. And it's just, really, even if you're not like, going to go out and get all excited about eating a little fish, I think you should get excited about it. But even if you're not going to, what goes on along the shoreline when there's a herring spawn? It's so bizarre to me to walk down the Embarcadero when the herring are, are lighting up the whole shoreline. And you'll see like 25 seals in the water. And you'll see a flock of cormorants that's got at least 8,000 birds in it going through the water. And you'll see pelican after pelican, boop, 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 just dropping out of the sky. I've even seen in San Francisco Bay an osprey in the bay grabbing herring out of the water. I mean, um, whales will come in as far as uh, like Alcatraz, because they smell it and they want to get in on it, but then they, they start moving in towards the shore and like, eh, look at all these, yeah, there's cables and sewer lines and ships and fuck it, I'm out of here. <laughs> but, but like the, the abundance of animal life, of nature, and this is in, in a, the middle of a city, there's really, in my experience, I've not experienced, I've never really seen anything quite like in, in an urban context. I grew up in New York, and you know, we have eels under the piers and bluefish and stuff like that, but like a herring spawn in the middle of a major urban center, I can't think of that. I mean, maybe in Vancouver or something? Not even there. And it, so even if you're not interested in eating them or using them for bait, they're great bait for everything. Um, just to go down to the bay when it's happening and stand there. And, and I mean, uh, last year or two years ago, I did a tour for the Aud Audubon people. And there's a whole contingent. So there's the Audubon people who are like insane bird nerds, like out of control. That's their life is like looking at birds. Maybe some of you are uh, birders or amateur ornithologists. I don't know. But... Um, but then there's the, the bird nerds that can identify seagulls. Now this is, this is like bordering on some kind of a psychosis because like to the average eye, like, like seagulls really look a lot alike, 
you know, but um, you'll see like a little bit of different type of grayness in some of the wings and the, the size is a little different and sometimes they have a, a red bill and sometimes they have a yellow bill, but they really look a lot alike. But um, the variety of seagulls, if this is, is some kind of an enticement to you, is, is supposedly insane during a, well, it's really hard to get people excited about this, but, um, but just to go down and, and see 85,000 seagulls, that's what they estimated. There were 85,000 seagulls along the shoreline in uh, Tiburon last year. But it's the same thing on the Embarcadero. And it's, uh, it's just gorgeous and beautiful. We have a, uh, a commercial fishery for them in the bay. One of my good buddies is a commercial herring fisherman. And um, they use gill nets. And they set the gill nets up next to the shoreline where they think the herring are about to move in and lay their eggs. And so when the herring move in to lay their eggs, they hit the gill net and they get stuck. And then they, the guys pull them out by the thousands. I, they, uh, a good day, they'll get 20 tons in one day. Um, and uh, the reason we're not so concerned about that is that they're only fishing a total of 5% of the total biomass of the species. So last year, the biomass was 15, what did I say, 15,000 tons. So they're only fishing 5% of that, which is not considered to have a great toll on the, on the fish. Is that enough on the herring, babe? Sounds great. Okay. Um, yeah. So the, the question is, and thanks for asking that, if somebody has never really gone out fishing or foraging before, what are what the most basic things in here? Well, I go over the nuances of clamming, and you've got some great potential spots for clams in our region of California. You're going to have to drive to some of them to get to the clean ones. I mean, there's hella clams in San Francisco Bay, but no one in their right mind would eat them because clams live a relatively long time and they don't move. So whatever's in the water in that spot is not gonna, is gonna be in you if you eat that clam. So you wanna go up the coast. There's a couple places down the coast you can go to. I try not to burn locations, but it's a, it's a Google search away finding the good locations for, for clamming and picking mussels. Um, so that's one place that all you need is a, a recreational sport fishing license. You can take this book and it'll really help you. And then seaweed, I, I cover all the basic seaweeds along our shoreline. Again, you should get a fishing license if you're gonna do seaweed. A lot of people think they don't need it, but you should have that. It's like 50 bucks and it's good for, a whole, for the year in which you buy it. So if you buy it now, it's only good till December 31st. Wow, I feel like I'm back in my day. I used to work for the fish and game department explaining all the rules and regulations and I'm back there now. But, um, in any case, uh, yes, and so the seaweeds and the clams, you know, some of the fishing stuff, um, if you have some basis in fishing, uh, I think you'll, you can, you'll, be, you'll be fine. Um, but if you have no basis at all in catching fish, like you've never gone like this, if you've never done that before, then there's a whole chapter on poke polling. Poke polling is a, a technique that was used by Native Americans along this coast for thousands of years, I think, at least. And um, you can catch a lot of fish by just taking a stick. Now, the modern adaptation of this stick is you take the stick, you take a wire hanger from your closet, you unravel it, put a little loop in the end, tie some line onto it, put a hook on the line. So you've got a stick, a bamboo is great, a bamboo stick, wire hanger, loop in the wire hanger at the bottom. Wire hammer, hanger is taped. So stick, tape, wire hanger, loop, line, hook. Onto that hook, put a little piece of squid. Go to any fish market in the Bay Area and buy a pound of squid for $2.69. And then walk out at low tide and everywhere you see a rock that comes together with another rock or a hole or a crack, <coughs> stick that gently into the, yeah, the sexual innuendo here is through the roof. You stick your stick into the hole. And then as you go like this, and you kind of like do this, uh, the fish that live in the holes between the rocks will come up and bite the hook and then you pull them out of the hole. And that requires none of this, click, and it's a very good way to go along the California coast and get your own fish. 
Uh, so hopefully that answers the question. And that, that's a very a wonderful technique for a beginning fisherman to use, because you'll catch stuff, and all you have to do is tie a couple of knots, and that's it. Yes? Uh, so two questions. Yes. So cover, like, what do you do with the fish after you catch it? Uh -huh. You've never gutted or cleaned or anything? Right. So there's a little bit on cleaning, and there's a lot on fish prep, and there's a whole section on how to prep small fish. And um, I mean, as far as cleaning a fish, there's like five million videos. <coughs> and I really felt that those are so much more useful than anything I'm going to write. And also, like writing that, it's so simple, and yet it's just not the kind of writing I like to do. So um, I would, I would uh, refer you to YouTube for actually cleaning big fish. For cleaning small fish, I have all kinds of techniques that I wrote in here, which is probably where you're going to be anyway if you're just starting out. Also, the thing is full of recipes. So every, every little section has recipes, most of them written by the lady in the corner. One other question. Do you talk about or do you do any kind of like diving-related foraging, like lobster hunting? Or well, you know, we don't have lobster in this area of California. And this is the guide to the northern California coast. The only lobs the seen lobster... <laughs> You've seen them because, because of El Nino, we had a, a few lobsters were caught off of Pacifica last year. And sometimes they'll see them. But if you're, if you're going to be a lobster diver in, in Northern California, you are, you, you're in for a lot of empty buckets. More Southern California. Oh, Southern California is where they live. Okay. They only came up here over the last two years. There's been a few stragglers. There was a guy on, on a, on one of the big fishing websites who was like, posted a picture of himself with two. <laughs> but I mean, that's insane. And then they, he got them at Lindemar. I mean, that, everybody. That, so that just went around all the fishing circles. And everybody was like, what? <laughs> uh, there's a few things like that. Like lately, there's last couple of years, there's been bonita up here. And that's not typically a fish we get. But that's because of, um, because of El Nino. We got a lot of these warm water animals up here. Mm -hmm. Our water's really cold. Spearfishing, I didn't get into too much here, but I did get into diving for, um, for rock scallops. So if, if, if there's one thing that's really, really awesome to go risk your life for, is rock scallops. I mean, they're just the most delicious thing. And is that the same as abalone? No. Oh, I, I got into the diving a little bit on the abalone section, too. More about how easy it is to kill yourself when you do it, <laughs> <laughs> which almost happened to me. I wrote a whole thing about my first abalone dive, my, you know, I was new. My buddy took me out, and we went in. And uh, the whole time I'm out there, I'm just like, man, this is so, this is just sketchy. I just know this is sketchy. There's seals everywhere. And he's like, you don't have to worry about seals everywhere. What you got to worry about is when they're out of the water, right? Literally 15 minutes later, he's got his abalones. I'm still half drowning trying to get the abalone to come up to the surface. All the seals are sitting on the rocks, every one of them. There wasn't a single one in the water. And, and his boat has drifted 100 yards away. And I'm stuck in the middle of this cove. And I start going like this, and he's waving back. He's not moving the boat. So I just, I was like, OK, you know, I got a, a flash. I got a, a, an abalone iron is made out of steel, and it's flashing in the water. OK? I got my big rubber thing. I got the thing that measures it. That's flashing in the water. So flashing is something that sharks really like, you know? And I just start swimming. I'm like, fuck this, I'm going to do the Michael's Phelps. I'm going to like beat all the known records, man. I was like, zhush, zhush. I get all the way back to the boat. I'm like, totally tired. I'm like, you asshole, I can't believe you. Couldn't you come over? And he's like, oh, there's, there's some fish biting here. He's fishing. I, I put my arm over the side of the, it's a Zodiac. We're in a 10-foot inflatable Zodiac, which are, those are pretty rugged boats, but 10 feet or 12 feet or something. And I put my arm over. I'm like trying to get up. I'm like, ugh. And I'm like, this is the moment right here, right? Because... I got all the stuff dangling. I had all my gear dangling around my belt, you know, and my legs flapping in the water. It's like, this is where you're going to friggin' get me. And I'm like, I finally like, get out of the water. And I'm like, OK, I'm, finally, I'm in the boat. And I look over at my friend, and he's got his rod. And he's, he's, going, and he's like, oh, oh, man, I got, oh, I got one on. Because he was fishing while I was swimming. And, and I look kind of over, and the water's very clear. And it's a lingcod. I can see that. And it's small. We call those shakers, because you just shake them off the hook, because they're so small. But he's bringing it up, and, and I'm kind of looking at it in the water. And, um, and all of a sudden, underneath the fish, there's just this 
whoosh. Like the, the whole color of the water just changed, and it went whoosh. And we both went, what the fuck was that? And he's like, he, <laughs> he's like looking down, he's like, huh? And he starts reeling up like this, and then just out of nowhere, man, I don't even know where this thing came from. There's like a 12-foot great white shark coming up underneath his fish with its mouth like this. And we're in this little freaking boat. Dude, I'm sitting like this, and it's there. Like if I want to put my arm down its mouth for some insane reason, I could have done that. And uh, I just kind of looked over the side, and I, got, I still have one of my flippers on, man. I'm like, one flipper on, one flipper off. And then I just started screaming. <laughs> and my friend, you know, uh, he, uh, he's sort of an unorthodox guy. It, it, like, so the, my, my feeling, like, at that moment, the thing's coming up after the fish that you're reeling in, just get the fucking thing out of the water. Let's get out of here, you know? But he's kind of like, he just kind of stood there. He's like, oh. <laughs> like, he, he, like, had the fish on the surface. And, it, and like lingering to like sort of tease the animal. And I was like, get it out of the water. And he was like, okay. And, it was like, and, we, and we took off and we left it. And I, th I, I often regret actually, because it was so close to us and it circled us. And I, I regret that my instinct was to grab for my phone and get some video footage of this thing that was like right next to us. And in doing that, I mean, how often are you going to be that close to a great white shark? I mean, I've seen them in other fishing boats where they're like over there or over there. But like in a, in a little zodiac where it's right next, like you could grab its dorsal fin. Um, and, and instead of experiencing the moment, I was like looking for my phone. So I, I really wish that I hadn't done that. I really wish that I had just been present and watched that thing all the way around the boat. But, but I, I mean, I saw it close enough. But the, the upshot of this was, of course, it didn't encourage me to continue my abalone diving career. <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm sort of a wimp when it comes to that. Uh, when I go get abalones, I do a, a thing called shore picking, which can, is also really dangerous. A lot of people drown shore picking because you, you, you think you know, you're, in, you're in water up to here, so you dive down to go, and then you're kind of like under a rock, and you can get stuck. And you, you can drown in that much water as easily as you can in 20 feet. So in any case, that story's in there, a longer version of it. So um, thank you, Kurt. Yeah. This is really awesome. All right, Paige. And here's my book. And um, if you didn't get one, oh, also, I do a, I do a uh, monthly update, um, if you want to be on it, where I talk about when the herring are running and what fish are happening in the bay and seafood and where to get seaweeds and this kind of stuff. And if you want to get on that, that email list, it's at the door with the with my lovely fish wife, Camilla, over there. I also have a Sharpie if you guys want Kirk, to send your book afterwards, too. Yes, I'll sign your book if you want. Thank you so much, Kirk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.